Our next presenter is the president of Lockwood Aviation Supply, and he is the only Kodiak authorized master service center in North America. He is the foremost expert on Rotax engines, their care and feeding, ADs, service information on the two and four stroke engines for light sport aircraft. His topic today is the pilot's guide to Rotax aircraft engine maintenance. Let's welcome Mr. Phil Lockwood. Thanks, Walt. Thanks for the intro. All right, we're going to give you some uh, good tips on Rotax 9 Series maintenance, an intro to some of the differences between the 9 Series and uh, other aircraft engines that many people are familiar with, like Homings and Continentals. Uh, <coughs> I will uh, just note that uh, we do have uh, four uh, Kodiak authorized service centers in the U.S. We are actually the only uh, Kodiak service center that is an FAA licensed repair station and specializes just in Rotax aircraft engine maintenance. Now the 9 series engine is unique uh, in aircraft engines today uh, because it has a, a, a unique combination of assets. One, it has liquid cooled heads, which is relatively unusual. It helps us keep the, uh, the, the temperatures stable in the head. It, uh, it enables the engine to resist shock cooling during uh, rapid power transitions. It also enables us to get a lot of power out of a very compact engine. If you want to cool a, an, an engine with uh, air-cooled heads, you have to have a large displacement engine and turn it slow in order to be able to dissipate the heat and have enough fin area. With the 9 series engine, the 100 horsepower version is just over 1300 cc's, 1 1.3 liters, and we're able to put out 100 horsepower out of that small size displacement lightweight engine because we're cooling the heads with liquid. We also use a dry sump system, which enables us to use a smaller quantity of oil. Now, <clears throat> if uh, with that sump, that vertical oil can, because it's fairly narrow and tall, we can get away with about three liters of oil, about three and a half quarts. And uh, <clears throat> that actually uh, keeps the, the system lighter, and uh, it also conserves oil. Now the oil tank cover <coughs> gives you an insight into which connection you need to make for the uh, feed line and the uh, return line on the oil canister. As you can see, one of the connections actually goes all the way down near the bottom of the canister, and that is the feed line. You want to make sure when you're hooking up oil, uh, the oil feed line that goes to the pump on this engine that you do hook up to this, this line. And you can see that ends up in the bottom center of the tank which makes sure that you're going to get oil uh, at all kinds of attitudes, even if you're slipping or skidding or climbing or descending at a very steep angle, which many of the light sport planes are safely capable of doing. Now we do use a, a, an automotive style filter, but it is not an automotive filter. It's one made specially for Rotax uh, by Champion. Now <clears throat> you do want to make sure that you use the Rotax filter because it has a higher bypass ratio uh, pressure release valve than a standard automotive uh, oil filter. And that's because in a standard automotive filter, they don't anticipate that their customers will start up their engine in the morning, let it run for maybe two minutes, and then firewall it and leave it there. And that is what we anticipate many of our customers will do. And what that does is it, it puts a, <clears throat> a tremendous strain on the oil system. It goes to a pretty high pressure when the oil isn't quite up to full temperature yet. And if you have a uh, automotive filter, you will be bypassing uh, the filter system with at least some of the oil, which means if there's any debris in the system, it'll get by the filter element. With the Rotax filter, with its higher uh, bypass setting on the valve, as long as you have about 120 degrees Fahrenheit oil temperature, you will not go into bypass. And that is why our minimum oil temperature for takeoff is 120 degrees. Also, you notice that on this picture we have a, uh, a, a little bit of uh, sabotage uh, uh, marker on that to make sure that it hasn't turned since it was put on. 
Rotax is now being fairly specific about how they want you to tighten that filter. Uh, they want you to spin it on, of course lubricate the, uh, the filter gasket, spin it on until it makes solid contact and I find that to be about one-eighth of a turn past when it initially touches and then go 270 degrees of rotation and if you do it like that uh, your filter will not come off and uh, you'll, you'll have some, some good, good results. The 9 series also uses a five-piece crankshaft and that enables the crankshaft to be made very compact. Uh, if you were to forge the crank you would not be able to come back in on itself like it does here in these pressings. Uh, so <clears throat> another piece of the puzzle which helps to make the engine very compact. We use a gear reduction drive on the 912S which is the most popular version and the ULS we use uh, 2.43 to 1 ratio and that means we have a very slow prop speed which keeps the engine quiet and enables us to produce a lot of static thrust swinging large diameter props. Normally, you're not going to exceed about 2,400 RPM in flight. We use a nickel-silicon alloy impregnated cylinder wall. It's an aluminum cylinder. And this is, uh, this is pretty neat for a number of reasons. For one, it's very lightweight. For two, it transfers heat very rapidly. Now, the cylinder, you'll note, is air-cooled, while the head is water-cooled. That gives us some redundancy. In the case, uh, uh, if you were to lose your coolant for some reason, uh, you do have some cooling on the cylinders and you can continue on at a reduced power setting. Now, with the uh, nickel cell cylinder lining <coughs> on that cylinder, a lot of people are hesitant uh, to embrace that technology. Uh, but I'm here to tell you that it really works very, very well. BMW is using it on uh, most of their current automobile engines. Porsche has been using it for years. It's a little more expensive, but it gives great results. The piston to cylinder clearance on a 9 series engine is so precise, so tight, that on a new engine, it starts out 0 to 8 tenths of 1,000 of an inch total piston to cylinder clearance. Remarkably tight. And that means that these engines don't really require a break-in period. On a Lycoming or Continental, after overhaul or after new manufacture, you run the engine hard for the first hour or so until the ring seat and the oil consumption drops. When the oil consumption drops on a new Lycoming or Continental, that tells you that the rings have seated. And what you're actually doing is you're machining the rings while you're running the engine so that they fit to the cylinder walls properly. This engine is so precise, it's built so precisely from the factory that there is no need to machine or break in the rings. It won't burn oil typically right from the get-go. And our oil consumption is more in line with automotive uh, standards. It's not unusual for uh, a 9 series engine to run for 100 hours and only burn about half a quart of oil. And you can go up to 100 hours on an oil change if you're using unleaded fuel. I'll get into the fuel a little bit later. We just talked about the piston to cylinder clearance, how tight it is. And uh, another, I think, great feature of this nickel cil uh, cylinder is how well it wears. Uh, it's not uncommon for us to see a 9 series engine that's gone over TBO to like say 2,000 hours be torn down and measure the total piston to cylinder clearance with a new piston and have only about 1,000th of an inch wear. So not only are these cylinders lightweight, very precisely machined, they cool very well, they offer very low oil consumption, but they also wear better than a steel cylinder. And the last plus is that they won't corrode or rust because it's a nickel silicon alloy. Now we have internal power generation, <coughs> which is another nice feature of this engine. Rather than having to rely on an external alternator, we actually have coils that are bolted to the block and they're excited by magnets inside the flywheel. So <coughs> really nothing is moving but the flywheel, which has to be there anyway and all your generating coils are, are bolted to the block so you don't have a belt or gear driving that uh, charging system. It puts out AC current and it's rectified externally. Now the two uh, lobes that are, uh, that are pointed out here by the uh, orange arrows, those power the external uh, AC ignition modules. Now, the fact that we have electronic ignition, a dual, completely redundant dual system, is pretty nice. But it is different from the automotive 
AC, uh, ignition systems that everyone's used to and the fact that it runs on AC current. The, the uh, <clears throat> ignition systems that you see in modern automobiles are 12 volt DC and they actually operate off the battery which although it's rare it means that if you were to have an alternator failure and your battery were, were to run down too low then the ignition would stop functioning and the car would stop running. I've actually had that happen to me once uh, when I was in college, uh, the car I was driving, the alternator failed, and I was on a long trip, and I didn't, I didn't have a uh, voltmeter in the, in the car, so I had no way of knowing until the car started bucking and kicking, and that was because the battery had dropped down to about 11 volts, and it didn't have enough power to, to uh, power the ignition system anymore. That won't happen on a 9-series Rotax, because we're using AC current directly off these generating coils to power our ignition system. It only needs the battery to run the starter on startup. The, the, the remainder of the coils are used to provi provide current to rectify externally to 12 volt, actually 14 volt DC to charge your battery. There you have a maximum of 18 amps <coughs> available, 14 amps continuous, which is enough for most of the modern avionics uh, that we're using in these light sport airplanes today. We also use automotive spark plugs, which are very, very inexpensive compared to the uh, uh, spark plugs required in Lycoming's and Continentals. Anybody who works on those today knows how much the spark plugs are. So that's a nice, a nice plus. The uh, 9 Series engines that are coming to us today in, in North America come standard, the 912S, with a overload clutch. That overload clutch does not slip unless you approach the maximum torque capability of the crankshaft. It's mainly there to protect the crank in the case of a prop strike. Another nice feature uh, that these engines offer. Now, the, uh, <clears throat> the actual uh, damping system in the gearbox is also uh, a nice plus because it allows us to use very lightweight propellers. Uh, you'll notice on a lot of the light sport airplanes out here today that they have a lightweight composite prop. Many of them are foam core. Some of them have a, a, a carbon fiber shell and uh, they're often 10 pounds or less, even for a three-blade prop. Very, very light. And of course, that enhances overall performance because weight is, is, uh, is going to deter from your performance. Now, the fact that we can use these very lightweight props with the very lightweight hubs is due to the overload clutch and the torsional vibration damper that is built into the gearbox. Most of these propellers that we use very successfully for many, many hours would not be uh, uh, safe to use on a direct drive engine because of the torsional vibration that a direct drive engine pumps into the propeller. And that's why the props that you see on most uh, conventional direct drive aircraft engines are much more massive, not only in weight but in the size of the hub, because they have to be. We also use dual constant depression carburetors. And uh, uh, they are a, a nice feature in that <coughs> they maintain a constant mixture as you climb. It's automatic uh, mixture control and it's a function that works pretty well on these engines. So you only have typically one throttle lever, no mixture control, and you just start it and stop it with the ignition just like a car. <clears throat> now uh, I know I'm going to get some questions later on as to why the engine's not fuel injected since it's a modern engine and we have, uh, we have this uh, dual electronic ignition system. And uh, the reason there is we do get good power output out of the dual carburetors. Uh, if we were to go to one carburetor, we would give up a fair bit of uh, performance. So we want the dual carbs for that. Uh, the carburetors are fairly easy to, to work on. If the main jet were to get plugged up while you're in Alaska, you can drop the float ball and you can clear that pretty easily. So there are some advantages to having a mechanical carburetor in access and, and ease of maintenance. But um, it's, it's difficult to convince many of the uh, suppliers that produce fuel injection components to allow them to be used in aircraft. And that is the, the battle that Rotax has right now. So <clears throat> that's really uh, the main reason that we don't have uh, multi-port fuel injection. It's not that Rotax doesn't know how to do it or doesn't want to do it. It's that uh, we have these uh, liability issues uh, with companies like Bosch that uh, if they produce uh, 1,200 units a day just for Honda Accords, um, you know, our volume isn't very appealing to them. Even though the 9 Series has about 80% of the light sport market in the world today and is probably one of the largest uh, production engine, aircraft engines uh, right now. 
Now here you can see a, a spec sheet taken right off the Rotax web page, and uh, it, it is interesting to note again the, uh, the displacement of these engines down here, uh, 912S at uh, <coughs> only 82.6 cubic inches, uh, 1,350 cc's. The engines are also uh, certificated in the standard category, FAR 33 certified. Uh, all the 9 series engines are available in a both a ASTM compliant version and a fully certificated version. And there is a price difference. And the reason Rotax does it that way is there was a substantial cost involved in certifying the engine. But uh, their policy is that if you don't need the extra uh, uh, capabilities that you get with a certified engine, in other words, the ability to put it in a standard category airplane and use it for any commercial purpose that the plane is, is designed for, like prop spraying or, or uh, banner towing or uh, air taxi, uh, then you shouldn't have to pay for the extra cost involved in certifying it. And that's why we have a price spread between the non-certified and the certified version. The non-certified version does meet the ASTM design standard, and that is the engine that you'll see in most of the light sport airplanes out there today. The difference, by the way, in the designation, uh, 912 ULS is the ASTM compliant version. 912 S, for example, would be the uh, certified version. Now, all the uh, light sport airplanes today that are being factory built have to meet the uh, ASTM design standard, and it's the same goes for the engines, as I just mentioned. Only mechanics that hold a light sport repairman certificate uh, with a maintenance rating uh, may perform the non-owner maintenance on uh, special light sport aircraft. So those of you who are mechanics, uh, this is going to bring quite a bit of business to the AMP mechanics and the repair shops because uh, unlike the amateur built home experimental airplanes that most of the 9 series engines have gone into in the past, with the new special light sports you have to have uh, the, uh, the training and the certificate to be able to work on them. <coughs> now, if a special light sport aircraft is being operated for compensation or higher, then only an A&P can do the annual <coughs> condition inspections. However, if the airplane is not being operated for compensation or higher, just being used privately, then a uh, light sport repairman with a maintenance rating can do both the 100-hour inspections and the annual condition inspections. There again, the difference is if it's used for flight instruction and rental, then the uh, LSRM can do the 100-hour inspections, but the annual inspections require an AMP certificate. IA is not required in, in, in the case of maintenance on these airplanes. Now, mechanics who wish to perform maintenance on Rotax engines install, installed in special light sport aircraft must meet the training requirements specified by Rotax and utilize the correct tools and fixtures as outlined in the apl applicable Rotax maintenance manuals. All the maintenance manuals are available online. And what we find today is that most of the special light sport aircraft manufacturers, airframe manufacturers, uh, they refer to the Rotax maintenance information for maintenance. And that means that you must follow the Rotax uh, maintenance information. Um, so the 100-hour inspections and any other maintenance that they lay out in their maintenance manual is what you must uh, perform. And it must be done by the people that they specify and the tools that they specify in the way that, that they specify, which works out well because it assures that you're going to have uh, proper maintenance. Now, <clears throat> to help train uh, AMP mechanics and get them uh, ready to work on these engines, uh, we have a number of new schools that are available. These schools can be uh, taken any one of the four service centers that Rotax has around the country and up in Canada at the Rotec facility in British Columbia. At our facility in Sebring, Florida, we actually have a full-time school, and we offer these courses at least every other month. Some months uh, we double up, so we have about 10 courses a year going right now. The first course is a two-day service course. Uh, that course gives you all the basic information you need to do basic maintenance, troubleshooting, 100-hour um, inspections, uh, it's very, very good. Those people who have taken it uh, are all quite happy with, uh, with what they've learned. Now, the next two-day segment 
is called the maintenance course. And that goes on uh, to teach you actually uh, how to do the annual condition inspections and how to remove components, ship them off to a uh, overhaul center for overhaul and then reinstall them properly. That's a, an additional two days. And then the third course is heavy maintenance and that actually involves training you how to overhaul these various components, cylinder heads, uh, gearboxes, that sort of thing. Now, uh, what we find so far is that most of what the mechanics need to, to, to know to work on these engines is, uh, is taught in the first two courses. Probably 90% of what you're going to need. So those two are very, very cost effective. How many people here are, uh, are mechanics? Got a couple of mechanics. Okay, and how many are owners or prospective owners? Okay, most people. Okay, so um, what you want to do if you have a, a, a Rotax powered aircraft or a special light sport and you're looking for someone to, to, to be qualified in your area. Uh, if you don't already have someone that's qualified, um, <clears throat> try and convince a buddy, uh, a good AMP mechanic, uh, to go to one of the schools and get qualified because there is uh, you know, quite a bit of business coming on right now. And so I think it will be worth their while and worth your while to do that. This is the, uh, the training course for aerotechnical. Now we have a lot of owners that go through the first two courses also that want to learn about maintaining their engines because I mean they're very detailed we go into the types of oils, the types of fuels, uh, how to do the uh, 100 hour inspections, how to do basic troubleshooting. So uh, we do have a lot of owners going through those courses. You can see the, uh, the schedule up until October. You can also get that schedule anytime by going to aerotechnicalinstitute.com. Now, Rotax has redone uh, most of their manuals recently, and they're very good. They're available for free online. I find going to the Rotax factory website uh, is, is helpful, or the Roan website are probably the two uh, that, that I use most often. The factory website is rotax-aircraft-engines.com, and you can download any of the current manuals for free, anytime. When you go to the factory website, this is what it looks like. That's what the, the page is going to look like. And you would simply uh, move the cursor to documentation right there and click on that. And it's going to pull up this page. And then <clears throat> each time you click on, on something, you're going to get a scroll list, which I believe I have right here. So you get your scroll list if you want a maintenance manual, for example, on a 912 ULS. You go down here, click on Maintenance Manual, and then uh, you would click on Search Database right here, and it's going to pull up what you see below. And then you click on the PDF file over here on the right, the blue PDF file that you want, and it'll open up an Adobe P PDF file which will give you the complete document. The other site that I really like uh, is the Roan site. It's very, very helpful. Um, and uh, that has all the same information as the factory site with the addition of some really good training videos. Videos that show you things like how to uh, change the oil properly, uh, how to comply with some of the latest service bulletins. So that is uh, uh, a really, really handy site. In, in, in the case of this site, uh, again, you can uh, <coughs> Uh, go ahead and, and see, I think I've got, yeah, click on support and then go down to expanded video instructions right there. And uh, again, those videos are, are really good. Now we get a lot of questions about oil, oil and fuel. So <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and spend a little bit of time explaining to you which oils you should use and why. And, and these recommendations change, so you might want to check either with one of the service centers uh, on, a, on a fairly regular basis and check the Rotax website for the latest oil bulletins. Now, <clears throat> over the past few months, we've been recommending these three oils. Uh, you see on the left the uh, Pennzoil, which is a mineral-based oil. It's actually manufactured from their Pure Base uh, product, which is, uh, uses the automotive base stock, which is quite highly refined. And then they add a gear anti-wear package to it which we like on the Rotax series engines because it helps uh, reduce wear in the gearbox. 
That's a mineral-based oil. It's available in a 10W40 and a 2050 weight. In the center, you see the Mobile One, which is a full synthetic. Now, the full synthetic oils do not work well with Avgas. You can use a little bit of Avgas with it, uh, but we don't recommend uh, a lot of Avgas use with the full synthetics. The full synthetic does give you that 100-hour oil change interval, or once a year, whichever comes first, if you're using mostly unleaded fuel. On the right, Golden Spectro makes a semi-synthetic, which can work with Avgas or Autogas, uh, and also is quite a good product and available in 1040 and 2050 weights. Now, Shell, um, I think partly because of the size of this market now and, and the fact that the Rotax engines have become extremely popular around the world, uh, they have uh, began producing a new oil, which is designed just for the Rotax engines, the Rotax aircraft engines. And that's called the uh, AeroShell Oil Sport Plus 4. It's available in a 10W40 weight. It's a semi-synthetic and will work with Avgas or Autogas. Now, before I go on to question and answers, I want to spend some time on uh, fuel because we're getting a tremendous amount of questions about fuel. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the different fuels that are available right now, Avgas, 100 octane Avgas with, with lead, Autogas with and without alcohol, uh, and then the Autogas, as you know, is available in 87, usually 89, and then 91, 2, or 3 octane. If you're going to use the autogas, the 912S requires premium autogas. That's 91 octane or better. 93 works, 92 works, 91 works fine. You can use 87 octane regular gas in the 81 horsepower version of the 912, the 912F uh, and the regular uh, 912UL. That's one advantage that that engine has if you're traveling cross country because most airports that carry MoGas, as they call it, uh, carry regular MoGas at 87 octane. So you have to be careful if you're flying with the 912S <laughs> that you don't land at an airport that has MoGas and then pump 87 octane in it. It's not enough octane. The 914 Turbo requires premium 91 octane or Avgas. Now, one of the disadvantages of Avgas in our case is that it has a tremendous amount of tetraethyl lead. Now, the lead about 18 times as much lead as leaded automobile gasoline had back in the 60s. It's a lot of lead. If you take that lead out, the octane would drop down to about 91 octane, which means a Rotax 9 series engine would be happy to operate on 100 LL without any lead in it. Um, we feel that uh, unleaded uh, aviation fuel is coming in the not too distant future. Uh, we know that there is only one lead plant left in the world, and that's in England, that produces the tetraethyl lead product. And we know that once that plant shuts down, it'll be the end of the line for, for, one, for uh, leaded Avgas. There are just a couple of countries that are using large quantities of that. And uh, so, you know, at some point, environmental issues involved are going to force uh, that lead plant to shut down. Uh, we do. We do prefer to use the unleaded gas, although we can operate on the 100 LL. Uh, when operating on unleaded gas, we get a lot of questions about alcohol. Everybody's telling us, well, you know, I've got 10% alcohol in my state. I've got to use the uh, fuel with alcohol. Rotax has officially approved up to 5% alcohol in the gasoline, and that is uh, <coughs> partially because Europe, they use 5% alcohol in the fuel there, and they've had uh, good results. Here in the U.S., many of the states are going to 10 percent. Uh, we haven't seen any operational problems with the alcohol at 10 percent. Uh, what we find is uh, that the fuel tanks and the fuel lines are, are the biggest concern. If you're going to operate with, uh, with uh, 10 percent alcohol in your gasoline, you do want to consider vapor lock as one of the uh, possibilities and that is most likely to occur at altitudes over 10,000 feet. Uh, I, I've noticed uh, that some aircraft don't use the Rotax recommended return system. What Rotax has done to help prevent vapor lock in the case of a uh, aircraft using autogas is they have a really neat little return system 
which uh, returns some of the fuel right at the carburetor back to the fuel tank. And that keeps the fuel streaming. If you develop any air bubbles in the system, it allows them to exit the system quickly and just go back into the tank, and it keeps the fuel cool. If you have that system on board your, air, your aircraft, then that also is going to dramatically reduce the chances of, of vapor lock. But as I said earlier, in most cases, you just don't see any issues. If your car will run on it, these engines run on it just fine. As a matter of fact, in Brazil, they're running on uh, 22 to 25 percent alcohol with stock jetting, and they're not having any issues there. Okay, I'd like to uh, entertain questions at this time. If you would, uh, if you have a question, if you'd wait for one of these uh, gentlemen to bring a mic to you, we have a question over here. Uh, like a lot of people, I suppose, I keep auto gasoline in my hangar and use it whenever possible. I go on the road, I need to fill up on the road with low lead, 100 low lead, 100, uh, yeah, low lead. The point is, what, what percentage of low lead use do you consider minimal, however you expect it? If you only rarely use low lead, you can use synthetic uh, oil mm -hmm. or semi-synthetic and not worry too much about the oil change uh, routine, for example. Right, that, that's a good question. If you're using, say, I, I feel anything 10% or less uh, would, would allow you to go to the 100-hour oil change intervals with something like Mobile One. If you're using much more than that, than 10% uh, Avgas, then I would go to the 50-hour oil change interval. Once you go over 50% Avgas usage, uh, then I would consider going to something like a 25-hour oil change interval. So the Avgas has a dramatic effect because we only have a small amount of oil in our system, and it's going to come, it's going to become loaded up with lead fairly quickly if you're using a lot of Avgas. So. If you're running on 100% Avgas, fine, a lot of guys are, uh, then you want to go ahead and change your oil, say, every 25 hours. If you're using it, say, 50% of the time, uh, then 50-hour then change intervals would be fine. And then uh, once you get down into the 10% the range, then go ahead and, and you can run 100-hour change intervals or once a year if you're running a synthetic. Uh, next question. Another question? Right over here? Okay. So at one point you were recommending 4X as a motorcycle oil, and I don't see that as, as one of your three. Was mobile 4X, it was a motorcycle oil? Well, there are two mobile uh, full synthetic uh, motorcycle oils that we recommend. One is the, uh, the V-Twin oil, and that is a, a, a 20W50 weight which you can use a 20W50 anytime you're operating at temperatures <laughs> above freezing. Once you go down below freezing, then you need to switch to a 10W40. Uh, and of course, the advantage of a 10W40 is you can use it in almost any temperature range. But I, I think it's better to use the heavier oil if it's available in hot temperatures, although the 1040 is fine. But yes, they do make one called MX4T. They've changed the name of that recently to MX4 Racing. Uh, I think we have some in our, in our booth, and you can see the, the new MX4 uh, racing logo on it, but it's the same oil, they're telling us. So and that's a 10W40 weight. Okay? We do, I think we, and we've got that in our booth uh, in uh, Building D, which is where I'll be headed after this presentation. If you have any questions that you're afraid to ask now, um, I'll head back over to the, uh, to the booth, and I'll be happy to answer them uh, over in D. Uh, we're right across from Garmin. We had another question here in the center. <clears throat> For the light sport, concerning light sport, if you attend the first two instruction classes, do you still need an A&P in order to make your own annual inspection? If you have a special light sport, is that what you have? Special light sport, factory built? Uh, no. Okay, if it's experimental, uh, you can do whatever you want. On an experimental, you can still do all the maintenance yourself. You only need to have a, uh, uh, an AMP sign off the annual condition inspections. If it's special light sport, 
then you have to have uh, a rated mechanic uh, perform all the maintenance that is not called out as owner maintenance in the maintenance manual of that aircraft. And, and you know, that's kind of an interesting point, actually, because on the special light sport aircraft, you really have to go by the maintenance manual on that airplane. The maintenance manual on that airplane is going to tell you exactly what you are allowed to do and, and not allowed to do. Uh, if it calls it out as, as owner maintenance, then you can do it. Often oil changes, obviously putting air in the tires, sometimes changing tires, things like that are often called out as owner ma uh, allowed maintenance. Anything that is listed as non-owner maintenance, that requires a rated mechanic to perform that maintenance. And, and the other thing that's interesting about the light sport is if, if it's not covered in the maintenance manual, then it's considered to be major maintenance. Once you go to major maintenance, you also need a rated mechanic, but you have to have written permission and guidance from the airframe manufacturer to perform that maintenance. For example, if you get a, uh, if you have a, uh, a problem with the airframe. Suppose you have uh, a little kink in uh, in in one of your uh, fairings around the, the uh, where the intersection fairing between the gear and the airframe, or it cracks. And that how to fix that is not covered in the maintenance manual. Then you would have to contact the manufacturer and say, "What's the procedure for fixing this?" If they say, "Well, you have to replace it," then you got to buy a new fairing. You could go back to them and say, well, could I repair it? This is, this is the procedure I want to use to lay up a few layers of glass, uh, repair it, and then paint it. And you send that off to them, and then they say, yes, we'll approve that. Then you can go ahead and do that. And you take their approval, and you put it in the logbook and show how you did it. But you don't do a 337, even for a major, you know, if a plane gets wrecked and the, the wings ripped off of it. Uh, no 337 is required to fix it. You contact the factory. If the factory says you need a new wing, you order a new wing, you install it to, to their guidance, and you're back in business. So it, it's quite different from standard category aircraft in that you, you actually uh, have some different restrictions. You don't have to worry about 337s. You don't need an IA, but you do have to follow the manufacturer's guidance. Next question. Question right here. I've been having problems trying to get a uh, repair facility, or not, I mean a maintenance facility for the Rotax engine. I've looked on Rowan and I can't seem to get a thing near me. And Where are you located? In Virginia, near Roanoke. In fact, I keep the plane in Martinsville, Virginia. We do have some new facilities uh, in that area. If you come to our booth, uh, Tisha is there this morning. Uh, and she should be able to tell you what facilities are available. Yeah, I'm a little reluctant to have my A&P mechanic at the airport do the 100-hour inspection because he's never worked on a Rotax engine. Yeah, is it a special light sport? Yes, factory yeah, built. Yeah, he actually wouldn't even be legal to do the 100-hour inspection until he's received one of the maintenance courses. Thank you. Uh, so, I mean, that, that I'll is... I'll find your booth. Unless the manufacturer of your airframe has approved AMPs to do the maintenance uh, without the course. So, but normally they just refer to Rotax recommendations on the, on the engine side. Uh, so, and some of the airframe manufacturers also require special training to do maintenance on their airframes. So you have, to, you have to really look at that carefully. Again, I would recommend that you find an AMP mechanic in your area that you, that you like, that you're comfortable with, and get him to go to one of the schools. In our area, in fact, up on Smith Mountain Lake, there's a new fellow who advertises as a light sport mechanic and claims that he has worked on Rotax engines. And I was thinking about maybe flying up there, but I'll visit your booth and sure, see Sure, visit the are. booth. If he's got the, the, uh, the, the independent Rotax repairman uh, technician certificate, then he's Rotax approved and he's, he's good to go. Um, what, what, you know, what happened in the past, a lot of these 9 Series engines were sold over the years and they, they went into amateur built experimental airplanes and the guys could work on them themselves and they didn't really need much help. They would call our shop up and they would say, hey, I got this uh, problem, how do I fix it? And one of our technicians would walk them through it. If they need any parts, we'd fire the parts off to them, they could have them the next day. And if they needed a special procedure, we'd walk them through it. And that would be it. And so 
big repair shops didn't have people bringing Rotax powered airplanes to them on a regular basis saying, hey, can you do a 100 hour inspection or can you do it, uh, an annual condition inspection on my airplane? And so these shops didn't see that as a, a business. I mean, they worked on Lycomes and Continentals because they came up to them every day and you know, once in a blue moon a guy bought a Rotax to them, but they looked at that as not an economical business thing to invest in tools for that purpose. It's all changing now because so many airplanes are being sold and built that are special, light sport, that require that kind of maintenance. Now what's happening is these, these shops have, you know, once a week or once every other week, somebody brings a special light sport up to them that's Rotax part and they say, can you work on my airplane? And what we're finding is these guys are going, wow, there's business here. I need to get my guys trained. And so we're having a lot of people come to the schools a lot of mechanics, so you, I think you're going to see that situation change very rapidly now, just because of economics. Next question over here. Phil, would you address the removal of the magnetic plug and how much we torque that down to, and should we check that magnetic plug at each oil change? Okay, the, uh, the magnetic plug which is located on the side of the gearbox, which is actually a chip detector. Uh, <clears throat> that plug is torqued to 200 inch pounds at the factory. It's a tapered plug, and it is fairly difficult to break free. It's, uh, the the uh, <clears throat> engines for the past five years or so have come with a T40 Torx fitting. You have to use a good quality one, a snap-on or a Craftsman, and often it requires uh, warming up the case around that chip detector to get it to break free. Some customers strip them out, trying to get them out. What we recommend you do, I like to check them on each, uh, each oil change. Uh, I believe Rotax only requires checking it every 100 hours or once a year, whichever comes first. But if you retorque it to 130 inch pounds and then you safety wire it, there's actually a uh, I think I have a picture of it up here that I can pull, but if you safety wire it, there's a bolt just above it and behind it, which fills the hole that you use to lock the crankshaft, to insert the crankshaft locking pin, and you can safety right around that. What we, what we find is that 130 inch pounds, it still takes quite a bit to pop it free. They don't leak, but they're, they're much easier to get, to get free. Now, Rotax has recently come up with a new chip detector that has a hex head which is mu much easier to remove. So, you know, you may want to look into, into upgrading uh, next time you have it out to that new hex head. All the new engines are coming through with them now, and we're just starting to see stock come in from Rotax. If you're planning on heading to our booth and buying one of those, I can tell you that we've run out of them. Uh, so, if you, uh, I don't know if you have any, Brian, I see Brian over there from Leaf. I think I have one left. You have one left, okay. So, somebody may get lucky if you, if you chase uh, Brian back to the Leaf booth. Uh, but we do expect to get uh, more in from Rotax uh, any time now. Does that answer your question about that? And you know, when you pull that chip detector out, you're going to see some fuzz, uh, some, some magnetic fuzz on there, and that's fairly normal, but you shouldn't see any chunks. No, no big chunks. We don't like chunks. Next question, back here in the corner. Uh, would you speak a little bit to recommended uh, engine speeds, RPM, both for our cruising and also for idle? Certainly. Uh, the uh, idle speed, Rotax recommends a minimum idle of 1,400 RPM. We find that to be a bit on the low side. Some of the very lightweight propellers work out fine at that but you are working the gearbox uh, fairly hard at 1,400 RPM. We prefer to see uh, 1,600 to 1,800 RPM. However, you don't want to set your idle over 1,800 RPM uh, because the choke won't work and also you'll have a tough time landing the airplane. It starts to get too high. Now, 1,800 RPM is a bit deceptive because remember you have that 2.43 to 1 reduction ratio. So even at 1,800 RPM, your prop RPM is still very, very low. Uh, you don't want to let the idle go below 1,400 RPM because if you do, you can actually get to the point where you'll close the butterfly valves all the way and shut the engine off. Uh, so you don't, you don't want, you want to make sure that you never get down below 1,400. Also, 
You should have a solid throttle stop in the throttle quadrant on the panel, whether it's a push-pull or a lever-style throttle. Uh, if you pull hard enough on it and you don't have a good stop, you will bend or flex the idle stops on the carburetor. And when that happens, um, you can bring the idle down too low and there again, you can actually shut the engine off. We find some people that don't have good stops on their airplane throttle system and or have the throttle set too low, they'll be coming in on final approach and they'll be high and they'll be yanking back on that throttle lever really hard looking for some kind of magical braking effect and they shut the motor off. So, uh, you know, you want to make sure that, uh, that you have that set up properly. And moving on to uh, takeoff. So, oh, the other thing is you don't want to set the idle above 1800 RPM because the choke won't work. The choke on these engines is not really a choke, it's an enriching circuit. When you pull the choke lever, you're opening up a valve that allows extra fuel to flow into the carburetor after the butterfly, the throttle butterfly. Now the butterfly is what's throttling the engine. When the butterfly is closed all the way, or almost all the way at idle, that allows you to suck the fuel out of the choke circuit. So actually the throttle is acting as the choke. So if you crack the throttle, pull the choke, you don't get much effect until the engine starts. So, so people that have a tough time starting a 9 series engine in cold weather, it's usually because they're cracking the throttle, pulling the choke, and then trying to start it. If you just pull the throttle all the way back to idle, use the choke, start it, and as soon as it starts, then you can add a little throttle and get it up to 2,000 or 2,200 until it smooths out. Now when you go to takeoff power, Maximum takeoff power is 5,800 RPM. You're allowed to be up above 5,500 RPM for up to five minutes. And then your maximum continuous RPM is 5,500 RPM or less. And you can maintain, if you're, if you're propped like a lot of the light sports are, 5,500 RPM at wide open throttle position for cruise. As long as your cylinder head temperature, your oil temperature, uh, and your coolant temperature remain below the maximum. Does that answer your question? Uh, about how low an RPM far as cruising? There's no minimum. Yeah, no minimum. Um, the only, the only uh, reference I would give you there is if you are running Avgas 100 LL, we talked about the tremendous amount of lead that is in that uh, gasoline, and that lead affects all aircraft engines. I don't care what kind it is. If you run low power settings, down below 5,000 RPM, uh, you will tend to build up more lead on the valves. If you're running auto gas, you can run as low a power setting as you want. It's just going to make the engine last longer. However, the engine, as long as you keep the temperatures within range and perform the maintenance as specified by Rotax, they don't seem to have any trouble at all going to TBO 1,500 hours, even when they're run wide open at 5,500 all their life, which is remarkable. But it's, uh, they, they're doing it quite, quite easily. Another question? Got everybody set? Okay, well, thanks for coming here today. I hope you guys uh, enjoy the air show. I will be headed back to the Lockwood booth in Building D, and I'll be happy to answer any of the questions you might have there. We have catalogs available. Um, so thanks for coming today. Thank you, Phil. Pretty interesting on how to operate a Rotax engine and some of those safety features. Are you still building air cams? Yes, we are. I actually uh, bought that company back about a year ago, so we're back rolling again. Well, if you want to see a fantastic airplane that will take off on floats with one engine, it's a two-engine airplane, take a look at that Rotax that Phil's designed and built. Uh, we're, uh, we're, about to go to the, we're, about, we're about to go to the roof, and we'll see our next speaker. because we're still on uh, audio's off at the moment but the camera's on okay all right great well you having fun yeah yeah good show uh, it's it's an interesting week strange people but interesting week some of those people are pilots yeah. <laughs> a lot of them are I'll ri i ripped through this one a little quicker than i usually
actually do. Uh, just a minute, sir. We'll be right with you.